everybody, and welcome to the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum online February happening. Uh, we've been doing these recordings for uh, some time now, and uh, we hope uh, a lot of you are going to join us today. Uh, February has always been a good month for us because around Valentine's Day, during our live film shows, which seems like eons ago now, we were doing a Valentino for Valentine's Day uh, show. And what better person to have with us today for our online Valentino show than the keeper of the Valentino flame, Donna Hill. Hello, Donna. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I think, if I'm not wrong, um, the last one that you guys did live, I was there for, for Horsemen. I think uh, okay. in 2020, I think, all those years ago. Okay. So I'm, I'm excited that you guys have invited me to present today. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, if you would like to go ahead and uh, start the presentation, it's all yours. All right. Donna Hill. All right. This is uh, in conjunction with my book, Rudolph Valentino, The Silent Idol, and I thought it would be interesting to present The Silent Idol off screen, which is something his fans didn't often see. And this is Valentino as his fans saw him, which is the exotic, you know, chic persona. And this is Valentino in private life. Here he is posing at the studio. That's his bungalow there behind him and his Franklin Coupe car, which he commuted in more often than he did in his big expensive cars. And this is where it all began for me when I first discovered Valentino and we're talking back in the ancient prehistoric days before video, before DVD, before streaming, back in the 1970s. I saw this photograph of Valentino and it made me question because I had been reading about him and a lot of what I'd been reading was not particularly flattering. He was identified as being sort of a peasant, not very smart, kind of crass. And this photo just struck me as here's a guy that's sitting here, you know, behind the scenes, he looks very serious and studious. And I wanted to know who this person was. So that started me on a journey that began, I want to say around 1976. And hasn't really stopped to this day. As you can see, as a even as a young two-year-old, two to three-year-old, Valentino was quite a looker. There he is uh, with his elder brother, Alberto. And this is about 1897 when he was two, two and a half years old. He was never particularly studious and he didn't care for book scholarship all that much. He was a scamp at heart and a naughty middle child. He was often reprimanded for uh, bad behavior. He preferred sports and monkeying around with mechanical things and being outdoors. He did, however, receive excellent marks for his penmanship. And here he is in costume for the school that he attended in Genoa after his father had passed away. So it was due to the benefit of his father being a veterinarian that he was able to attend this school. But again, as I said, his, his marks other than for penmanship and equestrian arts uh, weren't terribly high. Valentino at the age of 18 decided to uh, come to America. He sort of rigged it for himself by behaving as badly as he possibly could to get the family to say, okay, you're going to come to America and you'll be out of our hair. And this portrait is on his official identification papers. It's one of the last portraits taken of him in Toronto, Italy, which is where he was living with his mother. And he's a young man on the brink of adventure. Upon leaving for America, his brother Alberto later quoted Valentino as saying, Italy was too small for him. In New York, when he arrived, he went through various trials and tribulations of life. He was a spendthrift and, and spent his nest egg pretty quickly and had to find work. He worked as a gardener, a busboy, and ultimately as a taxi dancer. And it was through taxi dancing that he met up with a very famous lady. Her name was Bonnie Glass. She was a exhibition dancer and uh, had a club of her own called Shea Fisher spelled with a F-Y, not F-I. And this is one of the few existing photographs of the pair of them. They're in costume for an Apache dance. 
And this photo is very rare, and I'm very honored that the Valentino family uh, in my book allowed me to use a few photos from their collection, and this is one of them. So it was a, it's a great honor for me to be able to have this in my book because it's exceedingly rare. And this is from Valentino's period about 1916 when he was still doing taxi dancing. Uh, he had just finished dancing with Bonnie Glass and was partnering with a new dancer named Joan Sawyer. And he had with him his cards that he brought from Rome, which highlight his, quote, royal background. And the photograph here is inscribed to a name that will be familiar to the people in the Bay Area. Her name was Amy Crocker. And yes, that is the Crocker family of Crocker Bank. She lived in New York and held salons on Sundays. And that's how Rudy got to meet her. And this photograph is signed to her in his native French. And it is one of the few documents that exist where he's actually signed with his real name, which is Rodolfo Guglielmi. Very few things have I seen with his legit real name, other than a few contracts and stuff like that. This is one of the few photos that he actually signed with his full name. This is a photo dating circa 1915 or so. It's in Atlantic City, and Rudy always had a passion for speed. This was something that he developed in Italy with the Fiat automobiles that he ran across. He loved to take things apart. And I don't think this car is his because he didn't own his first car until years later, but he's posing very proudly in front of it. And I'm sure that given the opportunity, he would have backed it out and driven quite speedily away and probably crashed it into something. And as I mentioned in the prior slide, this is a few years later. This is Valentino circa 1921-22 in front of his home that in Whitley Heights. He is sitting in the Cadillac that he just restored. And he's with his friends, Douglas Gerard, who's there in the front seat with him. And Robert Flory, who's the gentleman in, with the big sweater. And then the gentleman behind him, I believe is, um, oh, is his manservant, I can't remember. And I'm blanking on his name right now. What you don't see in this photo because I've cropped it down is the, the Cadillac is still on blocks, but he had just finished it and he was very proud of working on the car. And here he is in Paris uh, in 1923 with his wife Natasha Rambova. They had just completed the mineral lava tour and he arranged to rent cars from the Parisian automaker Avion Voisin. And this is the, his rental car. He had also ordered a car for himself. And I think had Voisin realized what a reckless driver he was, partially in view of the fact that, like myself, he was extremely nearsighted and didn't wear his glasses, as far as I know, if he even had more than one, one or two pairs. Natasha later wrote that the driving was so stressful for her that she in the midst of their trip to Italy, she got as far as Rome and then backed out and ended up going back to Nice where her parents had a, an estate. And he ended up driving the rest of the way by himself down back home to Toronto. So there, there, there is no word on what condition the car was when he brought it back to Paris, but I suspect it was more than a little bit worse for wear. This is a wonderful shot that I love of Valentino test driving a Voisin in the Bois de Boulogne in 1923. And sitting behind him, of course, is the chauffeur that was assigned to him to test drive the car. But of course, Rudy had to get behind the wheel. And here he is at his Whitley Heights home in California. And this is the Voisin that he brought home with him. It is a cream colored car, there's red upholstery, and it currently has been restored and is at the Silmar Auto Museum it used to be owned by the Merle Norman Company. I'm not sure if it's the same, but it is in Silmar now. And you can see the car and it's quite big and quite attractive. His later trip to Europe, when Valentino was in Italy, he ordered an Asada Freschini. And you will remember the Asada Freschini from Sunset Boulevard. That's the car that Gloria Swanson has that she said she's cost $28,000. And I suspect that his Isada Freschini cost pretty much the same. And this is Valentino posing with the artist Federico Beltran Masses, 
when the car had been delivered to Los Angeles, finally. It's big, beautiful, I don't want to say sedan, it's, it's a giant car, as they all were in those days. And this is now, I believe, in a car museum that is in France. I believe it's in Paris. And here he is posing in his Isada Fraschini. Valentino is wearing his beard. This is circa November 1924. And you can see just a little bit under his arm, you can see the monogram that was on the door of the car. I believe it's also inside the car in various places, but it's his monogram, which is RVG. And uh, so it stands for Rudolf Guglielmi Valentino. And it, he used this on his letterhead and um, various other documents. But he was clearly very happy to have this very expensive customized car. Here he is in his garage at Falcon Lair. And through the um, chain link fencing, you can see the original gates to Falcon Lair, which are still there, but they are now currently covered with big iron plates. So people can't view in, of course. In his day, they were open. and. One wonders if fans would sneak up to the house and see if they could peer in and see him. He had a three-car garage, and it was fully functional, complete with a, a pit so he could get underneath the car. And he delighted in you know, fixing his cars, taking them apart, and working with his chauffeur. And the garage building is still there, and that's pretty much all that's left of the original Falcon Lear other than the gates. And they've, the, the garage building, of course, is filled in the pit. That's no longer there. It's just a, it's parking for the... Um, whoever lives on the property now. This is one of my favorite photos. It was one of the last inclusions in my book. It came literally days before I hit the publish button. I don't know who this young girl is, but I think this is just a wonderful photo. You can see that she's absolutely delighted to meet Valentino. And he loved kids. And I think this is a great photo. Um, it, this is taken around 1925 because he's got his eagle sideburns. And again, it, it's just a wonderful photo. And just to be clear, the signature on this photo is completely fake. It's not Valentino's signature at all. So Valentino was very relaxed in front of the camera. He moved gracefully and the camera loved him. And this is a shot of him that was taken during the filming of Stolen Moments. This is somewhere near Jacksonville, Florida on the beaches. He loved to go to the beach and he loved to swim and Clearly, he's pretty happy here. This was probably taken with his own camera because he was a camera buff as well as being a you know, wannabe mechanic. So it's a charming photo. And here he is. This is in Chicago. This is in 1925. And there are some other photos that I don't have taken on the same day showing him meeting kids at, at this train station in Chicago. And again, it's just wonderful. Left here, you will see a publicity photo that was taken circa 1921-22 on the Paramount studio lot. And then the photo on the right is Valentino arriving in Southampton in 1923. And he's, you know, had a nice crossing after a very arduous six months dancing across the United States and Canada during the Mineral Lava Tour. And it was a well-deserved vacation. And he looks pretty relaxed and happy and ready to return to Europe for the first time 10 years after he'd arrived in the US. Now, Valentino had a very special relationship with animals. They always seemed to gravitate toward him and he loved them. He had a series of pets, many dogs. This one, it's hard for me to tell if it's actually one of his. He had two German shepherds at the time named Marquis and Prince and Marquis. But what I love about this photo more than anything, because he was an outdoorsy kind of guy, you can see that his hair is a mess. It's not slicked down as you would see him on film. His shoes are untied. You know, his shirt is open at the neck. It's a wonderful natural photo and to me defines the hot mess, if you want to call it that. Unusually unkempt, but this is the, the private side of him. He was, you know, just like everybody else. He enjoyed getting out there and having fun. And uh, this photo shows it more than anything. Now, here he is. I initially thought this was 
Palm Springs, but I think this is probably taken during the filming of either the Sheik or the young Raja, that the horse looks like it might be the Kellogg horse, uh, Jadon, that he rode in the Sheik, but I can't quite tell. But it's it's a great photo because, you know, the horse is there, the horse is relaxed, ears are forward, and Rudy looks pretty happy and glad to be out riding a horse somewhere. Uh, here Rudy is with uh, one of his horses, his one of his favorite horses, uh, the horse named Yaki, although you can't really see much of Yaki. You can see the trust that they had built up between the two of them. He rode Yaki in both the Eagle and in Son of the Sheik. And he was a former police horse that Rudy bought in New York. In, it, in any case, they had a wonderful working relationship together and he really loved this horse. And you can also see that he loved getting up in cowboy duds. Lots of fringe here, lots of beautiful tack on the horse. And Rudy did ultimately want to play in a Western, which didn't happen, unfortunately. Here he and Natasha are in another very rare photo. This is one of the few photos, if not the only one that I've ever seen, in Natasha's bungalow apartment that she had on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, when they were living in Sin, uh, after he'd married Gene Acker and before the divorce was final, you can see the very ratty couch that they're sitting on and the pillows. Natasha always said that you could always dress up a room with throw pillows, which she obviously did here. And it's what they're with one of her Pekingese dogs that she preferred, and the monkey, it was um, a pet that I cannot remember the name, but clearly it liked Rudy. He certainly enjoyed it. And here is Rudy in France with his, one of his last dog pets, one of his most loyal pets, uh, famously known his, his Doberman pincher named Kabar. Kabar is buried at one of the pet cemeteries in Hollywood, and it is said that after Rudy passed, Kabar was inconsolable and ran away and would run the hills around Falcon there searching for his master. Kabar died in 1929 and still gets flowers to this day. Now, early on uh, in his career, Valentino discovered the joys of Palm Springs. This was before Palm Springs was the fashionable enclave it is today even before the uh, fashionable enclave it became in the late 1920s, early 30s, when Charles Farrell, the other silent star of Fox Studios, became mayor of Palm Springs and did much to promote it. Here, Valentino is pictured with a famous local eccentric. Um, he was a hermit, and his name was Bill Pester. And Rudy met him in 1919 with his future good friend, who he ended up bunking with in one of the a few hotels in Palm Springs, uh, Paul Ivanow, who is a name that will be familiar to people as a cameraman, assistant cameraman, but more generally, at least in the Valentino world, as one of Rudy's close friends. And this is from the same era, about circa 1919. I have no idea who the gentleman is in the uniform, but Rudy loved to ride horses. And, you know, as I said, he learned from his school in Genoa how to ride a horse, and he enjoyed it although he wasn't always terribly graceful when getting on a horse. This photo is, of course, one taken by uh, Paul Ivano from Rudy's camera. And here he is, finally, on the horse and ready to go out and travel in the hills. Natasha also enjoyed Palm Springs, and here she and Rudy are at, I believe, at the hotel that was, was run by Dr. White, who was a witness to their marriage when they went from Palm Springs to cross the border in Mexicali and get married, which caused a whole host of other problems for Valentino, which we may or may not discuss later. I'm not sure um, if I've got photos of the wedding here. But here you can see just in the very back at the Takiets Falls, there's Rudy in the water holding onto a rock and Natasha with her hair down there on the right in her uh, wool bathing suit, enjoying the um, the river there. And I don't believe you can go in the water there anymore. So this was enjoyable for them. They, they loved Palm Springs and vacation there often. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Rudy did have a camera obsession. And here he is on the set of The Sainted Devil, which is a, unfortunately a lost film. But here he is filming his own home movies and shooting 
the sequence that is being shot at this point. Next to him in the boater with, with the movie camera, who you can't see is cameraman Harry Fishbeck. And the gentleman below with the megaphone under the umbrella seated is the director, Joseph Henneberry. And this film was shot in New York. And as I said, sadly, it's lost. There's only a few seconds of film that exist. And I've got them posted to my YouTube channel, but it's, it's literally about five seconds worth of film. Here he is, circa 1916, 1917. I'm not sure where he is, but his uh, camera is next to him and he's posing for a photo taken by a friend. I think this is probably when he was on tour in the masked model. But again, there's no identifying information and the Valentino family had no idea either because I think it was removed from the scrapbook that it was in and either the pages were lost or there was no identifying information on the back of the photo. But I, I love it. It's a great photo, Rudy being very touristy. Here he is again on the set of Santa Devil. He's threading film in his camera. Here he is on the set of Blood and Sand, and this is uh, one of his still photos. The viewfinder up top is sort of like a early version of a viewmaster, if any of you remember that. But this is, he, he took photographs wherever he went and often on the set he he really enjoyed taking pics here he is again this is at the astoria studios in new york he's taking a photograph of his co-star nita naldi who has a very adorable puppy in her arms what's fascinating to me about this photo is you know they're filming in astoria which was right in the neighborhood. I mean, you can see the fence behind there, the houses just on the other side of the street. I mean, people could watch the, the back lot from their, you know, bedroom window. And again, that looks like Rudy's got the same camera as in the pre previous slide. So here's what his camera saw. There's Nita on the lower right posing with uh, the puppy. And the woman up on the upper left is Helena Dalgy, who was his co-star in the film as well. So I, I love these that, you know, there exist photos that he took. And this is one from my collection. And I think this is probably Palm Springs. And that's Rudy's dog, Kabar. And this photo taken from Rudy. I've got four or five snapshots that he took that came from his own collection. And so this for me is a treasure because he loved this dog and this dog loved him. Of course, then as today, there were always visitors who came to the set. And it's quite often that you see it, particularly in the 20s and in the 1930s, filming would stop if someone was on the set and they'd, you know, take some, the still man would take a few shots. And this is Rudy and Gloria Swanson and director Sam Wood clowning on the set of Beyond the Rocks. And just behind Sam Wood's elbow is the author Eleanor Glynn who wrote Beyond the Rocks. Uh, she paid a visit and there's just scads of photos of her on the set. And this is in St. Augustine, Florida. During filming Stolen Moments, this frog fountain is at the, what is now Flagler College. This was formerly a hotel, but the frog fountain is still there. And during filming, Rudy took time to, you know, pose for photographs. And I think this is from, again, a snapshot from his own camera, but I love it. It's a wonderful photo. Here he is on the set of The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse with what I call all of Rex Ingram's irregulars and unusual people during the filming of the tango sequence. June Mathis is center of the frame there sitting at the table. Rex Ingram is set right front. And then Rudy, of course, is standing behind. And many of the extras you can see in the film still to this day are posed around the um, table. This is another one of the snapshots that I have from uh, Rudy's own scrapbook. Here he is posing for a gag shot in front of his own grave from Four Horsemen. Spoiler alert, he dies in the movie. And be far, far, far behind him, you can see that Nigel de Brulier is waiting for his sequence to be shot because he's, he's waiting on the far side of the graves. And here is a Paul Ivano photograph taken during the filming of Camille. And this is on the Metro Coanga lot. And this will also be familiar to people because this is the same lot that Buster Keaton made many of his most brilliant short films, including The Blacksmith and One Week when he was under contract and filming at Metro. The lady with him is his co-star in Camille, 
which her name is Consuelo Flowerton. And Consuelo Flowerton was the mother of a future actress and teacher, Nina Foch. This is another Paul Ivano photograph. This is taken near Oxnard, where they filmed location shots of the Sheik. Rudy is uh, at the upper left in his Chinese pajamas. And in the center of the frame in the pith helmet is director George Melford. And to Melford's left is Agnes Ayers and um, the rest of the people are crew members. And this is the lunch tent on location. And you can see Rudy there at the center table on the left. The gentleman with the small mustache is the set director. And the lady next to Walter Long, I don't know who she is, on Walter Long's right is Agnes Ayers. The one on the left, on his left, I don't know who she is. And then director George Melford there is on, the, on our right. Again, back on the set of Beyond the Rocks, there's Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford paying a visit. Not sure if they're visiting Rudy or if they're more interested in visiting Ellen or Glenn, but there are a couple of photographs from when they did come to visit the set that day. And this is one of my favorite candids behind the scenes during filming. Uh, Rudy and Gloria Swanson are in costume for the flashback sequence and they're, as film stars do to this very day, sitting on the set and waiting for the setup. There's so much more waiting going on than actual acting. This is during the filming of Blood and Sand. And this is the gentleman dancer Maurice and his partner, I want to say is is it Marie Hughes? I can't remember her name, but they're visiting the set. And just to Rudy's left is Irvin Willett's camera. And she's wearing his cape from the film and they're just clowning for the camera. This is another candid during filming Blood and Sand. William S. Hart, the great Western star is there in the center. Rudy is in his costume for the film and director Fred Niblo is to Hart's left. And behind them, you, you can tell they're at the studio outside the studio gates is because behind them is a poster. And it's not an ordinary poster. It is one of the posters that would have been called a 24 sheet. So imagine a one sheet poster multiplied 24 times, basically billboard size. And that's how they decorated the walls outside the studio for future releases. Still dying to know what that poster is. I recognize the Paramount logo back there, but I have no idea what the poster is. Another shot from Blood and Sand, that's Fred Niblo with his script and June Mathis, who wrote the script or the scenario in the center and Rudy being his charming self posing for a photo. During filming Cobra, they of course took time for some gag shots. Uh, center, of course, is director Joseph Hennebury, who is doing his Napoleon impression. Gertrude Olmsted, who retired not so far long after this film was made, a year or two, she married director Robert Z. Leonard, as I recall. And there's Rudy holding the uh, pesky cobra desk ornament there, and then Nita Naldi and co-star Cass and Ferguson clowning for the camera. This is a wonderful candid shot of director Clarence Brown and Valentino during filming of The Eagle. And I wish that this were clearer and you could zoom in and see what that telegram is because Clearly, they're both pleased about it, but no idea what it says. Another one of my uh, favorite behind the scenes shots here is the unmistakable Eric von Stroheim, who paid a visit to the set of the Eagle, and he and Rudy posed for several photos. But this one's always been a special favorite of mine, because it's just so recognizable. This is Clarence Brown and his daughter, Adrian and Valentino uh, during filming. And again, this is another favorite photo. Her face says it all about what it's like to be meeting Valentino. She was clearly smitten and he of course loved kids. So, and there are several photos of them posing together, more formal than this one, but I just love this photo. Valentino posing with a, an obliging camel during the filming of Son of the Sheik for which he does not actually ride a camel in the film. Again, more visitors. That's his manager and friend and also husband to Agnes Ayers there on the left. That's Manuel Riachi, director George Fitzmaurice, and visitor Constance Talmadge. 
Now, in to back up a little bit, in 1922, after Valentino finished filming Blood and Sand and The Young Raja and Beyond the Rocks, he was upset at the quality of his films. He wanted to have more control and to have better productions. He didn't get that. He was he felt that he was not getting the artistic control that he deserved or wanted, considering the amount of money that he was bringing into the studio. So he went on strike. The upshot was, of course, that Paramount filed an injunction that forbade him to work in theater, to make other movies for anybody else. That was later lessened just a little bit by a judge, and Valentino was allowed to appear because he had to earn a living, but he couldn't appear in theaters. So he went on what is now known commonly today as the Mineral Lava Tour. He was hired by Scott Preparations, the Mineral Lava Company, to promote their beauty products by dancing a cross country dance tour. And they danced in armories, ballrooms, tent shows, pretty much anything where they could set up a dance floor across the country. It was exhausting. It went on for, it started in late February of 1923 and ended in late May. They made over 90 stops across the country and they went up to Toronto, Canada, and I think Ontario and Vancouver. And here is a photo of Valentino on the road. You see him circled there and the crowds that gathered to meet him. And this is just a small crowd. Here he is posing on the Leviathan, returning in November 1924. And the little boy you can see seated up there is Jackie Coogan, who was also on the same ship, who had a great time. And this is uh, from 1926. This is Valentino traveling to Europe. That's Manuel Riachi with him again. And uh, they are posing on the ship and they're playing shuffleboard. Again, we're back at November 1924. This is New York. I think it's New York or Chicago. Valentino and Natasha changing trains, waiting to return to California. There was a lot of brouhaha because he came back wearing a beard. When the pair returned from Europe, he was scheduled to make his first independent film, which was a film that was working title was called The Hooded Falcon. He was going to play a Moorish, a Spanish Moorish character, and he grew a beard for this. And of course, publicity was arranged that this was a big brouhaha and the barbers of America were all upset. In reality, that was all just publicity arranged by his manager. But he was famously shaved of the, uh, the beard once he got to Hollywood. And Valentino, of course, enjoyed adventure. And this is him arriving in France in 1923. He and Natasha had just flown across the channel. And she looks pretty happy because I think she's glad to be on solid ground. This is uh, another thing you may or may not have noticed that I have a slight obsession with Valentino with a mustache or facial hair. I very much like him with, with that. I think it's uh, attractive. And uh, he is sporting one here. This is 1922. This was taken in New York. He is seeing Natasha off, she's going to Europe with her parents, and he's about ready to head back to Hollywood to make another movie. And this is uh, in between times when they first got married in Mexicali and had their second marriage, because of course, in between, he was tried for bigamy. This is Valentino at the 3rd in Townsend train station in San Francisco. He came up to San Francisco often. He famously later on, this is famously later on, he came to San Francisco first in 1917. And this was during the tour of the masked model. We're not sure when he actually left the tour because I have in my book a hilarious photograph that is credited to be Valentino in the masked model. And of course, it is absolutely not him in the photo. So somewhere between Reno and San Francisco, he left the company, ended up in San Francisco. And among other jobs, he got a job with the Sanborn Insurance Company and went door to door selling bonds. Now, of course, he admitted himself he was an abject failure at this, and it also didn't help that 
people were not buying insurance bonds because they were at that time buying liberty bonds to fund the war. This photograph is from 1922 when he returned to the city to make personal appearances and appear at a benefit for the Veterans Administration where he danced. The lady to his left is Ivy Crane Lombard, who he met in 1917. And I don't know who the lady is on the right. But again, I love this photo because it's taken here. Valentino with his family here, his brother Alberto looking very warily at the uh, news cameraman, his sister-in-law Ada, his nephew Jean, or Jean, I think it's, the family calls him Jean, so, and he is wearing a calfskin coat that Rudy bought for him that he absolutely loved. And the dog is a wolfhound that he had recently purchased and was traveling back to California with him. And his name is Centaur Pendragon. And Alberto was horrified because the dog cost something like $500 at the time. And I haven't done the calculations to what that means in today's money, but it was ludicrously expensive for a dog. And here is Rudy when he first met his nephew in Rome in 1923. Jean is about 10 years old here, or nine. And uh, Rudy was a very doting uncle. He loved having him with him, and he enjoyed meeting him and spoiled him rotten. Here Rudy is with his manager's two boys, the young almond boys, that's Daniel and Robert. And this was taken at the almond's house in Beverly Hills. A nice snapshot of Rudy, and uh, he loved the kids and spoiled them too. Now, this is a photo I am 99% sure is taken outside Natasha's bungalow. Rudy's in silk pajamas, and his friend Douglas Gerard is getting hosed down. The backstory of this photo, I have no idea. It's taken by a Paul Ivano. Not at all sure what's going on here. And this is Rudy again with Douglas Gerard, at least the back of his head. This is in Santa Monica. Rudy loved to spend time at the beach, uh, and he often did back in those days. It was much easier for stars to mingle on the beach and not be recognized. He famously liked to toss around the medicine ball. He hung out with Jack Dempsey and Reginald Denny, and they all, you know, basically had a good boys club out on the beach where they would exercise, toss the medicine ball, and swim. In the early days of radio, and this is well before talkies, Rudy did make some appearances. Famously, in, during the Mineral Lava Tour in Detroit, he went on his rant about the studio, and it was so virulent, they cut him off in the midst of the broadcast. The photo on the left is Rudy in Chicago, and this is circa 1923. And then the photo on the right is in Atlantic City in 1926. This is very late in his career. This is very close to the time when Rudy passed, not too, not too far. Um, and uh, he's receiving the key to, this. oh, no, you know what? I think, I'm sorry, I think this is the Mineral Lava Tour and he's getting the key to the city, but it is Atlantic City. And again, during Rudy's last tour, when he was promoting Son of the Sheik, when he stopped over in Chicago, he, ordered a brand new custom radio. This is not the radio, but um, it's sim this is him shopping at the venue to buy his radio. He ordered it, it was constructed, and sadly, he did not live to see it. It, it was later sold in auction not too long ago, um, and I don't know who owns it at this point. As you might have guessed, Rudy was a bit of a fitness buff. He went so far as to pen a booklet called How to Keep Fit, which is the rarest Valentino volume out there. Um, happily, it exists online. You can, see, you can see it on the web. I don't even have a copy myself, and I have virtually every book about Valentino that there is, and I only know of one collector who has one copy. But this is one of the photographs from the book. There's a series of like 12 or 14 photos in the book of Rudy showing how he exercised. And this was all part of his deal with the famous publisher and also fitness buff, Bernard McFerdin. Now, McFerdin published many magazines. He was a one-man media mogul in the 1920s. And here is Rudy at McFadden Publications in Chicago where he had just signed a contract to do several things. One, he was going to write a book of poetry called Daydreams, which he did, and it was a huge success. And you can still find copies all over the place today. 
nice orange boards. It's a pretty book, the poetry. I'm not going to comment. And McFadden also published How You Can Keep Fit. And Rudy also signed a contract that he would write his diary of his travels because once he finished the mineral tour, he was going to go on a three month trek to Europe. And he did this, and this was serialized in McFadden's movie publication called Movie Weekly. It was serialized in 1924, and I think it stretched into 1925 in the Weekly magazine and had photographs that, uh, you know, either Rudy took in Europe or were mocked up. But it, it's, a, it's a fun read, and it was later published in book form in 1929 after Rudy passed. Again, here's another photo of him uh, posing in some of his workout gear. Now, he was very good friends with Jack Dempsey, and there's some newsreel footage of Dempsey here, which is this still a photograph is in, in evidence of, where he is coaching Valentino on how to box. Valentino did many things for his physicality. He ran, he lifted dumbbells, he boxed, he fenced, and he was at least for some time a member of the Los Angeles Athletic Club as well. But he did a lot of his workouts at home or at the studio, much like Douglas Fairbanks. And here are a couple of more photos from the uh, How You Can Keep Fit book. These were shot in New York. And I, I don't have the explanation on what he's actually doing in these photos, but th they are from the book. In 1922, that's B.B. Daniels and the sunglasses with Rudy. They're playing tennis for a benefit at Ala Nazimova's Garden of Allah home. Uh, so it's a charity event. I and mean, he looks very nice in his uh, tennis whites. And Bibi is not quite recognizable, but I guarantee you that's her. Again, another uh, beefcake shot of Rudy working out. Now, Valentino owned two homes in his lifetime. The first one was known as the Whitley Heights house, which is the neighborhood still exists. His house, of course, is, is not existing anymore. It, it was raised in the 1950s in anticipation for the Hollywood freeway. The foundation of the house, the part of it can still be seen, and I can't remember the ex exit off the 101, but you can see it there. And this photograph is one that was taken by James Abbey, a very famous photographer of the period. At Whitley Heights, after Natasha fled to the East Coast, after he was declared a bigamist, because his uh, their marriage in Mexicali was not legal, and his divorce from Gene Acker had not been complete. He erroneously thought that it was okay to cross the border and get married, and of course it wasn't. And he uh, ended up in jail overnight, and his friend Douglas Gerard got on the phone and called people like June Mathis and Thomas Meehan, and they raised the bail for him to get out of jail. So this photograph was taken, and there's a series of them taken by Abby to show his loneliness, missing his bride, and they were published in Photoplay. So this one is the living room, and just as an aside, the little table there uh, is a piece of furniture that was designed by Natasha. And here they are in front of the front door of the Whitley Heights house. Uh, there's Natasha and one of her Pekingese, and that's either uh, Sheik or Marquis. I got it wrong. Uh, Prince was another dog. So I'm not sure which dog this is, but again, it's Sheik or Marquis. And this is the interior of the Whitley Heights house. The pillows on the floor are designed by Natasha, and up in the archways there is the little dining room, the dining alcove. And here is another one of the uh, I'm so lonely I could cry photographs taken by Abby. And this is out on the patio looking out over what is now the uh, 101 freeway. And this is one of my favorite portraits of Natasha taken by Arthur Rice. And this is the back side of the front door and the two pieces of art I believe are hers. And she is posing with a cigarette holder, which I think is very chic, and she is wearing a Fortuny gown, which I think is also chic. Now, the second house that Valentino owned was Falcon Lair. And Falcon Lair, you can still go up to the gates up off uh, Cielo Drive. It was originally called Bella Drive. It's a very winding single lane road. The house no longer exists. It was, it was gutted. I'm extremely happy that I got to 
tour the house after it was first sold from the Duke estate to an architect who owned it and who I'd been in touch with. And this is a photograph of Valentino in the house. This is in, not the library, this is called the living room. It has opposite him, opposite this fireplace, are three huge arching windows that look out over the hills. It's absolutely stunning. Of course, the interior was entirely changed by Doris Duke. So all of the California Romantica, Mexicana style of the house inside was gone. And this is a property that is still standing. It's down the hill on Cielo Drive. It is now referred to in real estate listings as, you know, Valentino's house, but it's not. It was the house for his horses and dogs. And so this is 1926. He's out there with a few of his dogs. And his nephew, Gene, is there on the right, you can see. And you can see the stables. And the house design looks much the same today. You can see the three big openings where the stables opened out. And someone, you know, wrote to me recently and said, you know, oh, if those walls could talk. And I said, if those walls could talk, they would nay. Sorry. But this is a, one of the few buildings that is extant. Now, Valentino, when he met Federico Beltran Masses, he took up painting as a hobby and Masses taught him. And what you see on the easel there is Valentino's small copy of the painting La Gitana, I think it's called, that hung over his bed in his bedroom. And it was a Beltran Masses painting that he purchased and that he copied. As far as I know, no paintings of Valentino's survive. I've seen photographs of them from some that did survive in the 1950s, but if they survive to this day, I have not seen any. And this is a wonderful painting that Belton Masses did later after Valentino had passed, and this is uh, Rudy and Natasha together. It's in a private collection, but it's a very nice painting, and I'm glad to have at least a copy of it to, in color. It famously shows Belton Masses's trademark blue that he used. It's much like American artist Maxfield Parrish's famous blue that crept its way into all of his paintings. And now here are some Valentino portraits. This is one of the other last portraits of him taken in Italy. This is, you know, 17, 18 year old Valentino posing in his formal clothes. And the photographer has obligingly given him a little bit of sophistication by penciling in a monocle. But he's not quite sophisticated enough to carry it off. He's still very, very, very much the young teenager here. When Valentino first came to Hollywood, he worked in extra and small bit parts. When he heard that D.W. Griffith was making Broken Blossoms, it was going by another title. I'm not going to go by that title because it's highly racist. He did pose for portraits to try and get the role that ultimately was played by Richard Barthamless. And this is a beautiful hand-tinted original photo. And, you know, of course, sadly, we know Rudy didn't get the role. D.W. Griffith did hire him to dance a prologue for Scarlet Days. Dorothy Gish worked with him in 1919 in a film called Out of Luck. And she, you know, bent Griffith's ear to hire him because she liked Rudy very much. But Griffith never saw his appeal. So that was an opportunity missed, but not surprising. This is a portrait by Russell Ball, and Valentino posed for many of these. He loved dressing up in cowboy regalia. He wanted to make a film, either a Western, or he wanted to appear as an Indian. So in this series of photographs, he is wearing little more than a loin loincloth. And these were quite the flapper's delight when they were published in uh, movie magazines. This is an early portrait taken around the time he was making Four Horsemen. He was, while he was a fitness buff, one of his few vices was, he, was that he was a chain smoker. You can rarely see him in candid photographs or often in portraits where he's not got a cigarette in his hand. It is, it is one of his few physical vices, but you know nobody knew what cigarettes would do back in the day. This is another wonderful portrait from 1923. It was taken with a series of portraits that Valentino posed for for James Abbey, and this was during the Mineral Lava Tour. This is, of course, one of the photos from the Mineral Lava Tour. It's a James Abbey portrait, and they're both in costume. They famously, and Natasha was a famous dancer before she met Valentino. She danced with Theodore Kosloff. 
and took the stage name Natasha Rambova to be a, quote, Russian dancer. And they did a riff on the famous tango from the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse as part of their program as they danced across the country. This photograph is taken in New York. This is right before the Mineral Lava Tour started. The pair were on the board to plan the uh, Actors Fund benefit in January of 1923. And uh, so they're posing for White Studios. They're on the stage. They're in uh, Daniel Froman's theater. This is a portrait by a lady who became one of Valentino's good friends. And one of his preferred photographers, he visited her studio every time he went to New Chicago. Her name is Mabel Sykes. And this is also one of the first photographs I ever purchased of Valentino when I began to collect. This is another early photo. This is circa 1920. The photographer's name is Shirley Sloan. And she took several photos of Valentino in the 1920-21 period. And they're all really wonderful. And uh, this one I'm quite taken with. And when Valentino moved to Paramount, uh, he sat for a series of wonderful photos by the then house photographer, uh, Donald Biddle Keyes. Keyes was a wonderful photographer and he took some great shots of Valentino in costume for the chic. And th this one is particularly great, in my opinion. This is Valentino arriving in Chicago during the Mineral Lava Tour with his beat up valise there on the table. And this is at the Hotel Blackwell, I believe. And the hotel was just recently remodeled and is still in business to this day. And this is another photograph. This is taken in 1926. This is one of the later photos taken of Rudy not too long before he passed away. I love the photo, even though, you know, he is a little bit sick here. And clearly, I think more than anything else, this was a hot day because, you know, he's sitting there in his t-shirt. But you can famously see his uh, slave bracelet on his right wrist and, of course, a cigarette in his left hand, naturally. But I want to thank you for enduring my slideshow, and I hope you enjoyed it and that it was informative. And thanks, everybody. Oh, okay. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for this talk. Wonderful talk. Uh, I just want to let you know that at our museum, we have Donna's book. If you want to own an extensive collection of photographs. This is the best collection of photographs in one book that you will ever see. And we have copies in our museum store. So come and get them. And thank you for putting out this book, Donna. Thank you so much, Michael. It was, it was truly a labor of love. And while I've collected since the, you know, late 1970s, about 1978, I think I bought my first photo. I had the help of many collectors and archives to gather what I thought were the best photos. And um, so I tried to do my best. It was labor of love. And I, I was very happy to have that out there now. Okay. Now, uh, today we are doing, this is a recorded Zoom here, but later today at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m., uh, Eastern Time, we will be doing a live Zoom with Donna, and it will be a Q&A. So anybody that wants to come in, the link will be down there at 5 p.m. and can ask Donna any question she wants about Rudy. For instance, this picture that I found for my background, do you know where, uh, possibly know what that film is from? What that picture is from? I think that's from The Young Raja. Okay. Well, we'll have to go with that. Okay, thank you so much for this talk today, Donna. And thank you all for watching and have a good day. Thanks for having me. It was great. I really appreciate it.